I want you to identify with this cause. Say, how? How am I supposed to do that? I'm a university student. I, I'm a father. I'm a mother. I'm a, I'm a parent. I'm a grandmother. I'm 12 years old. I'm, I'm still going through school. How am I supposed to identify with Christ? How am I supposed to live that kind of Christian faith? Let me give you three suggestions. There may be more. The one is in your speech and in your lifestyle. When we say that belief drives behavior, we also say if you want to find out what somebody believes, you look at their behavior. So in your speech, in your lifestyle, that should reflect Christ. We don't want you to go live in a monastery on top of a hill and just go there for the rest of your life and say, well, I'm so afraid I'm going to make a mistake. I'm going to remove myself from society so that I don't ever make a mistake. We don't want you to do that. Jesus Christ wants you to be engaged in the world, but he says, as you're engaged in the world, watch the things that come out of your mouth, what you say, how you say them. As I said in a previous lesson, sometimes for me, the things I say to my wife, what I say is not bad, but it's how I say it. I say it with a particular tone of voice or a particular shortness or a particular uh, meanness or a lack of love, and sometimes it is what I say. People are listening to what you say and how that identifies you with Christ, but also how you live. Uh, in our culture, the, the way people dress is very important. We live in an American society where, especially the young women, our daughter is 16. We have a very hard time in our culture in America finding her modest things to wear that still look nice. As I said, I don't like to go shopping. My wife and my daughter will occasionally go shopping. And then they will ask me for my approval. And they say, do you think that this is too tight or this is too short or it draws attention? And honestly, sometimes I've said, Michaela, that makes you look beautiful. And there are some times where I said, Michaela, I, I'm sorry, that draws too much attention to certain parts of your body. Whatever standards are appropriate for Christian behavior, he doesn't want you to look awful, young ladies. He wants you to look beautiful. But he wants you to dress in such a way that you are not a distraction to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Men, the same way. It's how we live. It's how we dress. It's how we conduct ourselves. It's our attitudes. It's our demeanor. So how do I identify with Jesus Christ? The first way is with our speech and our lifestyle. Here's a second way through our unity with other people. I've said several times throughout this course that we live in a Western world in a very individualistic society. It's all about me. I can make my own religion. I can make my own path. I can do my own thing. And I, I tell to our people this many times. I haven't told you this many times yet, but I'll say it to you now. The Christian life was never intended to be lived alone. It can be lived alone. I have my own quiet time and my devotions alone. But as a whole, the Christian life was intended to be lived in community. You say, well, I go to a church of 500 people or 1,000 people or 50 people. Is that what you're talking about? Well, not necessarily. Small groups. Interactions with other people where you can discuss the things that are taught and the things that are shared. That there, there is a unity that comes when we do life together. For a number of years, my wife and I were part of a small group in our church. We had some who were younger than us. We had a few who were older, us, older than us. There was about a four or five couples that came to our small group, and we shared life together. There was one time when one of the men who was married came without his wife. Like, oh, where's your wife today? He says, well, I have something to tell you. And so we sat down and we began to talk and he said, uh, I have a confession to make. I have been having an affair with another woman. You what? He had told me before, so I knew about it, so I wasn't as shocked. But some members of our group had heard it for the first time. He says, I have been unfaithful to my wife. I've confessed it to her. I've confessed it to God. She did not have the, the, the desire to come tonight. She's too emotionally distraught. And we came together as a group. And we, the group didn't really know what to say. They were just in shock. We'll, we'll, we'll pray for you. Is there anything we can do for you? Well, no, there's nothing you can do right now, but just kind of pray for us. 
there, there was a, a uniting of hearts. There was a fear. There was a shock. There was a sadness. There was even some anger. I don't think anybody expressed it, but in that group, I know there was anger because I, I felt some of it too. It's like, what were you doing? You had a beautiful wife. You have a home. Why did you do this to your wife? You can express those things when you're in community, when there is a solidarity of, of being together on a regular basis. That's how we can identify with Christ, is our unity, our solidarity. The third way that I would say we can come together is identifying with the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's one message. Jesus Christ said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. There are so many religions out there these days that I have this path, I have this path, I have this path. I said, you know, I, I'm sorry that Christianity is so exclusive, but Jesus said, I'm the only way. But in being exclusive, he said, anyone can come on this path. The path is narrow, it's not wide, but anyone can come. Please come. That our identification with Jesus Christ comes because we have a unified, single message. So, how can we show our identification with Christ? In the way that we, we talk, in the way we live. We do it in our unity and solidarity with others, that we do life together with them. And third, we, we identify with the message of Jesus Christ, which has the power to change us. So Paul comes through these first number of verses, and he says, this is why I suffer as I do. But I love what he says here in, verses, in verse 12 when he says this, But I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Timothy, I'm not ashamed. I'm in this prison. It's dark. It's cold. I'm having a difficult time. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Timothy, don't be ashamed either. Please. So the call to courage in this long sentence from verses 8 to 12 is followed up in verses 13 and 14 with a call to guard the truth. If you know the truth, and Jesus said, if you know the truth, the truth will set you free. What is that truth? How do I hold on to that? That's what verses 13 and 14 say. When Paul says in verse 13, Follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me. Timothy, follow them. I've taught you so many things. You have followed me in so many ways. The word for pattern has the idea of being an example. One of the things that our children have done is they, when they were little children, they like to draw. And, and Chandler in particular really seems to have a skill for drawing. But when he was very young, he would get frustrated because he can't draw it perfectly. So what he decided to do was we would print off a picture with very dark black lines, and he would take a piece of paper. Let's say that this is the picture. He would take a blank piece, of, a white piece of paper. He would lay it on top, and he would take his color, and he would follow the line that he could see through the paper. So he would look at the example, and he would follow the example that was there, and when he got it done, he was able to color his own picture, and it had the lines where they were supposed to do. That's essentially what Paul is saying to Timothy here. He's saying, follow the pattern, follow the copy, follow the model of the sound words that you have heard from me, the healthy words, the rich words, the ones that you can make you wise to salvation, in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, and here's his key words, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. Guard the good deposit that has been entrusted to you. There is a sense where Paul says, I was given this trust. I was given something with which I was supposed to be a wise steward. I gave it to you. Now you hold on to it. Don't simply put it on a shelf. Don't be embarrassed about it. Don't be ashamed about it, but hold on to it. Use it. Embrace it. We strive to serve the contemporary Christian community and with a variety of Christian educational and evangelistic resources. To see TVS Resource Base, please visit tvseminary.com. There are some of you who may have a, a grandmother or a great-grandmother who has an heirloom piece of jewelry. I know a couple of ladies that I've met over the years where they have something that might be 100 years old. Their great-grandmother 
passed it on to their grandmother, who passed it on to their, grandma, to their mother, and then passed it on to them, maybe on their wedding day. And they will say, child, on your wedding day, I give you this, this pin or this brooch or this necklace. This, this necklace was bought by your great-great-grandmother in the year 1900. In the old country where she came from, she, she sold eggs and she sold milk and she saved up money. And what this piece of jewelry that I'm giving you today is more precious than gold, not because of the amount of money that it cost to purchase it, but because of who owned it. That your great-grandmother found this so precious, she wrapped it up in this beautiful little handkerchief and kept it in a safe place. And when it came time for your grandmother's wedding day, she took it out of the safe place and she gave it to your grandmother on her wedding day and on your mother's wedding day. And now I give it to you on your wedding day. He says, Timothy, you have been given an amazing trust. He says, by the Holy Spirit who dwells with us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. The knowledge of the Holy, who Jesus Christ is, the gospel, and all that the Holy Spirit brings the power with you to do it. But don't just wrap it up and put it in a little box. Use it, savor it, treasure it, learn from it. You here in the 21st century have been given a deposit. For the last number of days I've been sharing these lessons, I have been given a treasure, an opportunity for to teach to you what the pages and the lines of these words mean. I am sharing the deposit with you. When this class is over and you go from this place, I want you to just pretend that I have handed to you an incredible treasure of great price. Not because of who I am. It doesn't even matter who I am. It doesn't matter where I'm from. It doesn't even matter. If I'm important or not important, I'm not actually very important. But I was given a deposit. I was given an ability to think and to study and to reason and to preach God's word. And, you, and I have shared with you my heart, my passion, but most importantly, I've shared with you the meaning of the verses of this book in two letters. Now, what will you do with it? You can leave this class when this class is done and say, well, that was kind of interesting. Actually, some of it was boring. The classes were long. I was uncomfortable. Or you could say, I remember he taught us this in this certain verse, in a certain chapter. I want to look at that. Or maybe you'll be in a conversation with someone about the things of Christ and you'll say, I remember something that our teacher told us in class. Let me see if I can find it in the Bible. And let me share this verse with you because the way he explained it would fit this situation exactly. You see what I'm trying to do with you? I am entrusting you with what I have been given. And you don't hold on to it forever. Someday, someplace, somewhere, somehow, you're going to meet someone that you pass it on to. The thing with the gift of God's word and the truth that is possessed in these words is that it never gets smaller, it never gets used up. It's always as much when you give it away as what you were given. But the Word of God multiplies its effect. What are you doing with the good deposit entrusted to you? I'm trying to share it. My prayer is that you will too. So we come to the end of another section. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses, seven through, verses 8 through 14. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA, 
Write on the Czech memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300. Or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.